Welcome back everybody to Geology 101. In this unit we're going to talk about igneous rocks and volcanoes. So as we move forward in the class we start to zoom in more and more, starting with the tectonic cycle at first and now moving into the rock cycle. We know that rock in the mantle moves around, we know that some of it melts, we know that it gets to the surface somehow in volcanoes, but what does that process look like? How does it melt? Where does it melt? And what does it look like once it all cools down? Now on a totally unrelated note, completely unrelated, there are these things called igneous rocks. And some of them have these big interlocking mineral grains, could be light, could be pink colored, could be dark, could be kind of a mixture of the two. Some of them have two different grain sizes, small grains and big grains. Some of them have all these holes. How did they get here and what do they mean? What do they tell us about an area? Well, we get the answers to these questions and more in this first section, melting rocks. Before we can get to the fun stuff though, we have to do a little bit of terminology. So there's magma, which is what liquid rock, molten rock is called when it's beneath the surface, and then you have lava, which is molten rock when it's above the surface. But this magma, the stuff underneath the volcano that sort of feeds the volcano and fuels it, where does this magma come from? To answer this, we go back to the structure of the earth. What is earth made of? Well, we have our solid inner core, it's not coming from there, and we have our crust, that one's also solid, it's not coming from there. So we have to ask, is the magma coming from the outer core or is it coming from the mantle? And the answer is it's coming from the mantle. Actually, it's coming from the very uppermost part of the mantle. Most all magma is going to melt at a very, very shallow depth. We're talking about right here, very close to the crust, but not quite in it. So here's another way to visualize this. We have our inner core, outer core. We have our mantle with these big circulating convection cells. And then we have our thin skin, the crust. And our melting zones are going to be here, next to convergent margins, mostly, next to divergent margins, mostly. And I say mostly, the exception to this are the hot spots, which we'll get into later. So how does this magma go from the upper mantle all the way to the surface of the planet? Well, let's talk about the most common way that this happens. So the mantle is in constant motion. We have convection cells. It's always moving, and part of it is going to be rising. And as that mantle rock rises up, it stays at about the same temperature, but the pressure drops dramatically. And as the pressure drops, there is less force holding the molecules together, and so we go from a solid to a liquid state, it begins to melt. And you imagine this melt moving higher and higher through the mantle, all the little gas molecules, the other things inside of it, well, as the pressure decreases, the gas molecules are going to come out of solution and become actually gas. Pressure goes down, these are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the rock forces itself up through cracks all the way to the surface of the earth and out onto it. So this process I'm talking about here is method number one. This is the dry melt. This is the way that you get liquid hot rock at mid-ocean ridges and other divergent margins. The mantle rock rises. As it rises, pressure goes down, but temperature stays the same, and so it begins to melt. And one example you might think about here is boiling water. Taking water from a liquid to a gas is a little bit like taking mantle rock from a solid to a liquid. And it's easier to boil water whenever you are at a high elevation. Why? Well, at a high elevation, there's a little bit less of the atmosphere pushing down, a little bit less pressure on the molecules. And so it becomes easier to make that phase change from liquid to gas. On the other hand, if you try to boil water at sea level, like most of us are used to doing, you have to get to a higher temperature. It's harder to actually evaporate the molecules. The second way you can melt the mantle is by adding water. So we're at our subduction zone. Here we have this big downgoing slab of a plate, and as it descends into the earth, it brings all of this water and hydrated molecules and hydrated crystals with it and it starts to shed that water and dehydrate as it goes down. And where does the water go? The water goes into the rock right above the slab and starts rising up. As the water enters the above rock, it decreases the melting temperature. And so you form a magma. This magma continues to rise and force its way onto the surface into a volcano. This is the reason why we have volcanoes associated with subducting margins. And it's important to note here, there's this other process. So as the mantle rock starts melting, it starts to sort of eat, chemically eat, 
the silica in the rocks around it. And this has the effect of making the magma stickier and thicker and harder to move. For our final method, it's easy. You just add heat. The core of the earth is very hot. Occasionally, it will send off these sort of streams of heat called mantle plumes. We don't worry about why. And these mantle plumes will continue to rise. They rise because they are so much hotter than everything around them until they finally get to the lower part of the tectonic plate or the uppermost part of the deeper mantle as we see in our diagram here. And once it gets this far into the mantle, it becomes known as a hot spot. You have this area of anomalously high heat. Because there is extra heat, the mantle melts, and that melt makes its way onto the surface. Now, we can see the chain of volcanoes here. Why is there a chain? Well, the mantle plume, the stream of heat coming from the core, it stays stationary even as the plates move over it. So the plate is moving this way, but the source of the heat stays still, the burner stays in the same place, and so you have a chain of volcanoes which record the history of plate motion here. Okay, so we've talked about how these magma melts get to the surface, and we've talked about why it melts in the first place, but what exactly is this stuff made out of? And what you should imagine in your mental model of this is liquid quartz. You have silicon and oxygen, you put them together and they form this light in color, low density, but very, very strong body of quartz. If you melted this down into some kind of a liquid, that is what you should imagine for magma. You have a bunch of liquid quartz, you have water, and you have carbon dioxide. There's also this other factor I talk about that is the stickiness of the magma. This is the viscosity. It's how well any kind of a fluid, could be magma or water or even something that's a gas, how well this fluid resists shear forces. How well does it resist flowing? Is it easy to pour like water, low viscosity, or hard to pour like honey, which would be high viscosity? And the key factor which determines the stickiness of the lava is how much liquid quartz there is in it. If you have a lot of liquid quartz, a lot of silica in the magma, then it's going to be very viscous and hard to move. If there's very little of that silica, then it's going to be easy to move. It's going to be runny and flow well. So let's say that you put a fireproof, heatproof suit on, and you jumped into the volcano and you went even beneath it into the magma chamber. How would you describe the magma down there to somebody else? What would be the key factors? Well, the first thing you would talk about is chemical composition. How much silica is there in the magma? You would also talk about how much water there is, water vapor probably, and carbon dioxide, how much other gas is there. The next thing you would talk about is temperature. Are you on the low end of the scale, closer to 650 C, or the high end of the scale, closer to 1200? And you would talk about viscosity. So is this lava that flows like water, spreads out in every direction, very free flowing, or is this stickier magma which sort of stays in the same place and doesn't go anywhere at all. But out of those three factors, which one is the most important? Which is the one that influences the other the most? That would be the chemical composition. So you could have what's called a basaltic magma. That's going to be very, very low in silica. Because it's low in silica, it's very runny, it spreads out, and it tends to be a very high temperature. You could have something, we'll skip ahead, to rhyolitic magma, uh, which is going to be very high in silica content, not move anywhere at all, very, very sticky, almost solid. And then you could have something that is in between, the in-between member called andesitic magma. It's got some silica, but not a lot. It's somewhat viscous, but somewhat flowy. It's not the coldest magma. It's not the hottest one you've ever seen. Now, the final consequence of all these other factors is answering the question, how does this volcano erupt? Does it erupt gently or violently? Now, intuitively, you might think, that if it has a low viscosity, if you have this runny lava, it's going to spread out and cover a huge area. It's going to affect so much more. That is going to be the worst eruption. But that is not true. The worst eruptions are going to be whenever you have a high viscosity. So your andesitic, intermediate to rhyolitic magmas, these things are going to build up in pressure more and more and more without moving until the entire thing blows up. These are going to be the worst eruptions. So let's put it all together here. We have some magmas that are higher in terms of the silica content, some that are lower in terms of the silica content. Now, if there is a lot of silica, we have a rhyolitic magma, it's going to be lower in temperature, 
high in viscosity because the silica likes to hold on to each other and stick together so well, and you usually have a lot of trapped gas. The gas can't escape because the liquid is just so sticky and viscous and thick that it can't get out. Now on the other extreme, we have basaltic magmas or basaltic lavas, which are going to be more runny. They're going to be low in viscosity, they're going to be low in silica, there's not so much inside chemically that can form strong bonds with each other, tends to be a higher temperature, spreads out really far, and I'll move me. The gas content tends to be very low, you get non-explosive eruptions. Now, the final member is going to be your andesitic lavas or magmas. Uh, these are going to be somewhere in between the other two across the spectrum. Okay, next section we jump to a totally, completely unrelated topic, not connected at all, called igneous rocks.